we now have the idea of eigenvalues and eigenvectors and the fact that if we have a complete basis of eigenvectors, a matrix takes on a very special form, namely it becomes diagonal. And we also have the idea of orthogonality. So we could, in theory, given some vectors, construct vectors like i, j, k. So let's see about combining these ideas. What it will give us is a big theorem called the spectral theorem. So we'll discuss that theorem and do a couple of example computations and then summarize our results for today. Uh, very first thing then, we'll talk about orthogonality and how that relates to eigenvectors. So when we looked at y equals ax, we found that a can be represented as a diagonal matrix, provided we have enough eigenvectors. We also know that the Gram-Schmidt process allows us to take some vectors and construct an orthonormal set of vectors out of them. So if I have a basis of eigenvectors, the question is, could I possibly construct an orthonormal basis and still have my matrix A be diagonal? So could we combine those two ideas? So let's look at an example first. Here, I have a very small matrix, two by two. It's got an eigenvalue minus seven, an eigenvalue plus seven. And so I have a basis of one vector in each eigenspace. And when I look at those eigenvectors, and look at whether or not they might be orthogonal, well, the dot product is not zero. It's some nasty number, definitely not zero. So these eigenvectors are not orthogonal. And if I try and do Gram-Schmidt on them, well, I'll find the first vector still lies along the original direction, but the second vector got replaced by a new vector. Here's the picture. I started with the red vectors. The red vectors are S1 and S2. They are not orthogonal to each other. And now I replaced S2, this vector, by its orthogonal projection instead of the original vector to get a right vector. But now this new vector is no longer in the direction of either one of those eigenvectors. It's an entirely new direction. And so applying A to this particular vector is not going to have the property that AX is equal to lambda X for some lambda. So this new vector here is no longer an eigenvector. It sounds like bad news. It sounds like I can't apply Gram-Schmidt. However, that's not quite true. Look at this new matrix here, A, and I've computed the eigen decomposition. This is what I see. It's got two eigenvalues, an eigenvalue 10 and an eigenvalue minus 10. For the eigenvalue 10, 10 occurred twice, and so I've got two vectors in the basis. I've got a plane corresponding to eigenvalue 10. So for the other eigenvalue, minus 10, I have dimension one for the corresponding eigenspace, so I need a single basis vector. And if you look at this basis vector, it happens to be orthogonal to S2. That dot product between S2 and S3 is zero, but it's not orthogonal with S1. However, if I think about Gram-Schmidt, so here is an example. I've got my S1 and S2, they form a plane. The eigenvalue for this plane is 10. And then I have an S3 vector, and it sticks out from that plane. S3 happens to be orthogonal to S1, but it's not orthogonal to S2. But within the plane, S1 and S2, if I do Gram-Schmidt, all I'll do is I'll take this S2 vector and I'll straighten it out. I'll get it along this edge of the plane over here. And it's still going to be an eigenvector, and S1 and S2 still will define the eigenspace, and a linear combination of those new vectors will still be an eigenvector for lambda equals 10. I just can't combine Gram-Schmidt, I can't do Gram-Schmidt for different eigenvalues because that would get me away from the eigendirection. So any non-zero linear combination of the original eigenvectors S1 and S2 for lambda equals 10 gives me another eigenvector. And so using QR, these two vectors, a unit vector along the S1 direction plus an orthogonal unit vector in that red plane, gives me a basis for the eigenspace with lambda equals 10. That works. I just can't go across different eigenvalues. Now, if I ran the problem in the reverse, I could start with orthogonal eigenvectors and get some lambda matrix and multiply it all out, I would have an orthogonal set of eigenvectors. So I know it exists. The question that arises then is, under what conditions are we lucky? Under what conditions 
would this eigenvector S3 happen to be orthogonal to the eigenvectors S1 and S2, because then I would indeed end up with an orthonormal set of eigenvectors with a basis for all of R3. So when do we get lucky? The answer to that question comes from what are known as normal matrices. And specifically, there are matrices such that A times A transpose happens to be the same as A transpose A. So if those two products are the same, we call that a normal matrix, and it gets a special name, because if that's true, then that matrix is diagonalizable. And not just that, but the eigenvectors for the different eigenvalues are orthogonal. I wrote it out as a separate theorem because that's the fact that we really are going to be using, but that theorem is actually not strong enough. I can make a much stronger statement. It's called the spectral theorem. The word spectrum is associated in mathematics with the eigenvalues of a matrix. So a matrix A has a spectrum, it has a certain set of eigenvalues. If I start with a normal matrix A, then the theorem says I can diagonalize A. So there is a diagonal matrix lambda, but on top of it, I can diagonalize it with orthogonal eigenvectors. And therefore, my eigenvector matrix, which used to be called S, traditionally, we now call it Q when the eigenvectors are mutually orthonormal. So that matrix Q, therefore, its inverse is the transpose of Q. And so our eigen decomposition now looks like A is equal to Q lambda Q transpose. And if I try and multiply this out, I see that A looks like for each one of the eigenvectors, Q1, Q2, Q3, it looks like A is equal to lambda 1, Q1, Q1 transpose, lambda 2, Q2, Q2 transpose, lambda n, Qn, Qn transpose. And if you think back about the projection matrices in the special case when we had mutually orthogonal eigenvectors, you'll recognize these terms, Q1, Q1 transpose, as projection matrices onto the direction Q1, Q2, Q2 transpose, the orthogonal projection matrix onto Q2. Each one of these is an orthogonal projection matrix. And the lambdas are the corresponding eigenvalues. Now, what kind of matrices are normal? So here are examples of normal matrices. The first, the important class of normal matrices is symmetric matrices. If A is equal to A transpose, if my matrix is symmetric, then A, A transpose is A squared, and A transpose A is A squared. Yeah, that matrix is normal. Skew symmetric matrices, when A is equal to minus A transpose, they're also normal. Orthogonal matrices, well, Q, Q transpose is I, Q transpose Q is I, so they're also normal. There are also examples of matrices that don't fall in any one of these classes that are not symmetric, not skew symmetric, not orthogonal matrices. It just can happen that some given matrix happens to be normal and therefore has a complete set of orthogonal eigenvectors. The couple of remarks that I want to make, the first one I already did, but I want to emphasize it again, is that the most important case is symmetric matrices. So if I have a symmetric matrix, and if I look at the spectral theorem at that expansion, what I see is projection matrices onto the eigenvectors Q. And therefore, we also see the action that A has on a vector. I compute A times some vector. I'm going to get the orthogonal projection of that vector onto Q1, the component along Q1, and it's going to get scaled by lambda 1. The orthogonal projection onto Q2 gets scaled by lambda 2, etc. So we see what we already know that matrices A that are diagonalizable do, they scale the eigenvector components by the corresponding eigenvalue. The other thing about this definition here is that this happens over Rn. We don't have any complex numbers that come in here. It's just scaling, no rotations so that we had in the general case. So symmetric matrices now, let's summarize what we know about symmetric matrices. We've just added to it. If I start with a symmetric matrix, we already knew that A is diagonalizable. We already knew that it had real eigenvalues and real eigenvectors. Now we know that eigenvectors for different eigenvalues are orthogonal. 
and eigenvectors for the same eigenvalue. If those null space vectors we are computing don't happen to be orthogonal, we know that for a fixed eigenvalue, we can do Gram-Schmidt. And so we can make them orthogonal. And as a consequence, A is equal to Q lambda times Q transpose, where the columns of Q are these orthonormal eigenvectors that now form a basis for our N. And the lambda matrix is our diagonal matrix of eigenvalues as before. Now, a remark to make is that symmetric matrices of the form A transpose A play a very special role. In addition to being symmetric, if that symmetric matrix I started with happened to be some matrix transpose times that matrix, if it looked like that, an additional property that that matrix has is that it can't have negative eigenvalues. All the eigenvalues are either zero or positive numbers. And what you'll see in any discipline that deals with matrices is sooner or later, they find that A transpose A is an interesting matrix. So that they end up with some matrix A and then immediately compute A transpose A and then do an eigen decomposition. So it starts with some matrix A, forms A transpose A, computes the eigenpairs, and then assigns meaning to those special directions, to the eigenvector directions within the application that actually resulted in that matrix. So you'll see this progression going from A to A transpose A to compute the eigen decomposition of A transpose A. You'll see it everywhere. So now I have a new level in the summary table when I do computations. Basically, I start with the matrix A and I'll do my eigen decomposition. And once I'm done with that eigen decomposition, I'm going to do QR on basis vectors for each of the eigenspaces separate. And once I have those new or so normal basis vectors for each one of those eigenspaces, I'm going to use those to build my matrix of eigenvectors. So instead of S from the original vectors, I'm going to form a matrix called Q from the orthonormal eigenvectors. And the important thing to remember is that its inverse now is trivial. I've done extra work by doing QR, but I no longer have to do work to compute the inverse. The inverse is just the transpose of that matrix. So here is what a typical table might look like. I have my eigenvalues as before. Lambda equals two occurred twice. Lambda equals one occurred once. And the corresponding eigenvectors for lambda equals two, I have S1 and S2. And for lambda equals one, I have S3. So we have to do Gram Schmidt on eigenvectors S1 and S2 corresponding to eigenvalue lambda equals two, two vectors. And we also have to do Gram Schmidt on eigenvector S3, which corresponds to eigenvalue lambda equals one. And for a single vector, it just scale the vector to unit length. We then assemble the lambda matrix as before, but when it comes to assembling the eigenvectors, we are going to assemble them from the orthonormal vectors, from the Q vectors. So we're going to copy down the Q1 and Q2 vectors for eigenvalue two and the Q3 vector for eigenvalue three. Now, if you look at our computations here, the idea was that this starts from a normal matrix, so from a symmetric matrix in this case. So the eigenvector for lambda equals one must be orthogonal to the eigenvectors for lambda equals two. And if you check the dot products, the dot product of S3 with S2 is equal to zero, and the dot product of S3 with S1 is equal to zero. And as a consequence, the dot product of S3 with any linear combination of these two vectors, any other eigenvector for lambda equals two, is also equal to zero. And to repeat the extra computations we are now performing, is we do our eigen decomposition as before, but then we do Gram-Schmidt for the eigenvectors associated with each of the eigenvalues separately. And once we have done that, we are assembling the lambda matrix as before, and the lambda matrix is just a matrix A in our orthonormal set of basis vectors, or it would also be the same matrix A in our other set of basis vectors. It doesn't really matter which set of basis vectors we take. And we assembled not the S matrix, but the Q matrix from the orthonormal vector. And the result is that we get A equal to Q times lambda times Q inverse is now simple. It's Q transpose. So let's see how example computations might run. My first example is I have this 
matrix. And if you look at it, you see that, yes, it is symmetric. And therefore, we know we're in business. We can find an orthogonal eigen decomposition for this matrix. And it has eigenvalues, lambda equals 6, minus 6, and 9, which, well, I wouldn't get them by hand very easily, but I certainly get them with a computer. And I know that I am in business, that not only do I have an eigen decomposition, but that the unit vectors corresponding to these three eigenvalues are going to be automatically orthogonal, and all I will have to do is scale their length. So let's see how this goes. One thing I'll do if I do these computations by hand is I'll start the table and I'll fill in all of the results as soon as I have them. And remember, I want to check my trace formula. I want to check that the eigenvalues indeed add up to the trace of the matrix. So let's quickly see 5 minus 1 plus 5 is 9. 6 minus 6 plus 9 is 9. So, okay, it looks like I have the right eigenvalues here. My trace formula is satisfied. And the other thing I might want to do is to check that the eigenvectors for different eigenvalues are indeed orthogonal by doing the dot products. The other point to make is that we have to stay consistent with our table. Whenever we fill in an eigenvalue, the corresponding eigenvectors must be right underneath it in the same column. And I'll emphasize it again when we look at the table next. So our first step. We need to find the eigenvalues, and we found them somehow, lambda equals minus 6, 6, and 9. And therefore, step 1 is complete. We have the eigenvalues. Now we have to find the eigenspaces, so the null spaces of A minus lambda I. And there are three cases to consider, lambda equals 6, lambda equals minus 6, and lambda equals 9. So for lambda equals 6, we look at A minus 6I. We find this matrix here, we do Gaussian elimination, it results in a single missing pivot, as we knew we would have, since the dimension of the eigenspace is known to be 1. And solving for the homogeneous solution here, we find a single vector, minus 1, 0, 1, as a basis vector for the null space of A minus 6, I. Now for lambda equals minus 6, the computation is similar. So we have to look at A minus lambda I, and lambda is negative, so A plus 6I. Gaussian elimination yields a missing pivot again, and we have an eigenvector basis for the null space of A plus 6I consisting of this vector here. And we immediately check the dot product between S1 and S2 is indeed zero. Those two vectors are orthogonal, as our spectral theorem said they would have to be. Finally, case lambda equals 9 is similar. We take our matrix, we do Gaussian elimination to find our missing pivot. We find a new eigenvector, and if we do the dot products between S3 and S2 and S3 and S1, we find that they're zero, so these eigenvectors, these three eigenvectors are orthogonal from the outset. My next step is to run QR. Well, QR in each eigenspace simply says, scale that vector to unit length. That's the only formula that's left. That's W1 is equal to S1. Q1 is 1 over the length of S1 times S1. Scaling them, we have scale factors of square root of 2, square root of 6, and square root of 3 coming in. And now when we assemble all of our matrices, here's what the table looks like. We have three different eigenvalues, 9, 6, 6, 9. The multiplicities for each one of them were 1, so we knew we had a single eigenvector in the basis that we were going to find. So for eigenvalue plus 6, remember to write it right underneath, eigenvector S1. For minus 6, eigenvector S2. For plus 9, eigenvector S3. Then we do Gram-Schmidt for each one of the eigenvalues. So for lambda equals 6, we have a single vector, so we just scale to unit length. Similarly, for lambda equals minus 6, lambda equals 9. And when we assemble the matrices, the eigenvalues just copy down in the same order as above, so 6, minus 6, and 9. And the eigenvectors, we're pulling our orthonormal eigenvectors and copy those down. And so here is my lambda matrix and my Q matrix for A equals Q lambda Q transpose. Now, Remember that the eigen decomposition is not unique. How we order the lambdas and how we order vectors within an eigenspace is arbitrary. 
So if you and I did the same problem and wrote different orders of the lambdas down, we would get a valid eigen decomposition. And when we multiply out our eigen decomposition, Q times lambda times Q transpose, we both get A as before. All that is required is that we be consistent, that the matrices that we copy down and the vectors that we copy down and the eigenvalues that we copy down must belong together. For our second example, we'll look at this matrix here, 6 minus 2 and 2. And this time around, I'll actually make it a little bit more involved. I'll say I'll give you one of the eigenvalues. Somehow or other, I know an eigenvalue. I know it's equal to 7. So my first step is to find the eigenvalues. And of course, I could compute the polynomial and divide out lambda minus 7. But since I had that eigenvalue, I can do a little bit better. We know what the trace is. Lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 is equal to the trace of A. The trace of A, 6 plus 3 plus 3, is equal to 12. And therefore, from lambda 1 equals 7 plugging in, I know lambda 2 plus lambda 3. They add up to 5. If I compute the determinant of A, I find minus 98. I'd probably use Gaussian elimination, at least one step of it to make it easy. Once I have the determinant, since the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues, dividing out lambda 1, that we know is 7, we get that lambda 2, lambda 3 is equal to minus 14. So we know the characteristic polynomial. We have a minus sign because our matrix is 3 by 3, so minus 1 to the third power. A factor lambda minus 7, since 7 is an eigenvalue. And then the remaining polynomial is a factor lambda squared minus the trace of the remaining eigenvalues, minus 5 lambda, plus the product of the remaining eigenvalues, plus minus 14. And solving for the roots of that quadratic polynomial, I find 7 and minus 2. So now I've got my three eigenvalues, 7 repeated twice and minus 2. The next step is to compute the non-space spaces. Now space of A minus lambda I, and I have two cases, lambda equals minus 2 first. If I compute A minus lambda I for lambda equals minus 2, I get, after Gaussian elimination, I have a missing pivot, as I knew I would, because the multiplicity was 1. And the basis for that null space that I picked out is minus 1, minus 2, 2. Notice that Compared to the normal way of doing things, I chose to use alpha equal to 2 because that made the fraction go away. We are going to scale this vector to unit length to begin with, but whatever length we use, it really doesn't matter to get a decomposition. Let's do Gram-Schmidt right away. We have to do Gram-Schmidt for this eigenvalue, single vector, and so it's just scale that vector to unit length. Norm squared is 1 plus 4 plus 4, 9, so 1 over minus 3. I pulled out a minus sign, simply because I like one less minus sign, so a little bit better. Case lambda equals 7. Same thing, but this time we know that 7 occurred twice, so we know we have to find two eigenvectors. Here's my matrix. Gaussian elimination indeed finds two missing pivots, and writing down the eigenbasis is trivial since we have a single row. It's 1, 2 interchange, 1 sign change, so minus 2, 1 and one minus two interchange those two values and change one of the signs to one, and everything else is zero. The point, however, is that if I trust my computations, if I think that, yes, lambda equals seven is correct, then I know I'm going to have two missing pivots. I know I'm going to have zeros underneath. I know I'm going to end up with just this single row from the outset. And so just this single row is what defines my eigenspace. So I don't have to do Gaussian elimination. I don't have to do that extra computation. I can just read off the null space from that first row and get the exact same answer that I'd written down before. I said if I trust my computation, I could still do it and then simply check whether or not these are indeed eigenvectors, whether or not A times that vector S2 gives me 7, times that vector is 2. So I can always check. Now the last step is again, I'll do Gram-Schmidt. This time I have two vectors to do Gram-Schmidt on. So the first vector gets scaled to unit length, and the second vector, I'll have to use my Gram-Schmidt equation for two vectors and scale to unit length, and so I get Q2 and Q3. We have plugged in the values as we went, but here is the end result when I put my table together. I have an eigenvalue 7, which occurs twice, and an eigenvalue minus 2, which occurred once. 
Then for eigenvalue 7, we found two eigenvectors. I wrote in the s vectors as 2 and as 3. And for eigenvalue equal to minus 2, my lambda 1 eigenvalue, what I called it before, what the index I had chosen before, I found the vector s1. And what I have to do now is I have to do a Schmidt for each of the eigenvalues. So s2 and s3 belong together, qr on those. S1 belongs to eigenvalue minus 2, so QR on just S1. And finally, assembling my matrices, assembling the lambda matrix by copying down the eigenvalues. 7 occur twice, and so I have it twice on the diagonal. And finally, the Q matrices, I have to copy down the Q values. Now, some comments on what I did here is I removed a minus sign by reversing the direction of Q1. If you remember Q1, Q1 is minus one third times one two minus two. Well, I just need an orthogonal direction. I and minus I are orthogonal to J and K. I can change the direction of the vector. I can drop that minus sign if I so choose. And here I chose to do that. The other thing is I ordered my eigenvectors and eigenvalues differently than the order in which I did my computation, just to show that I could. So I chose to write lambda equals 7 first, and then lambda equals minus 2 second, and assembled my matrices accordingly. Remember, I just have to make sure that I stay consistent, as, that I copy things down in the same order. Could I do other orders? Of course. For example, I could split lambda as 7, minus 2, and 7. I don't know why I would do that, but I could if I chose to. The factorization is not unique. The last point I want to make is look at my matrix Q. I chose to pull out the common denominator. I chose to pull out 1 over 3 times square root of 5 so that I don't have any nasty denominators in my matrix itself. So, our takeaway for today for the spectral matrix, what happened here? What we've done is we found that symmetric matrices are quite special, and normal matrices in general are quite special. They always have an eigen decomposition. There are no complex values. We can always use Gram-Schmidt to make the basis vectors in each eigenspace orthonormal. The eigenvectors for different eigenvalues of A are necessarily orthogonal, so there's nothing special I need to do for those. I'm going to end up, if I do this process, if I run Gram-Schmidt on each of the eigenspaces, I end up with an orthonormal set of eigenvectors. And therefore, when I write down the spectral decomposition with that set of basis vectors, with the orthonormal basis vectors, the inverse of Q is just Q transpose. And so my decomposition, my spectral decomposition of the matrix A now looks like Q lambda Q transpose as opposed to Q lambda Q inverse. I seem to have done a little extra work, right? I've, I've done Gram-Schmidt in order to find Q, but I no longer had to compute the inverse. Why would I want to do this? Because it's very, very useful. We're going to see some direct applications next, but more important than that is if I want to do numerical computations. Well, orthogonal matrices are much better behaved than arbitrary matrices S and S inverse, as we had already discussed once. So remember, A equals Q lambda Q transpose is the preferable matrix decomposition when that matrix A is normal.